So it's like you started the new church and you have new members and all these members do not really know a lot about Christianity or do not know a lot about God. So they are newly, you know, they're probably not even born again yet, but they just had an interest of becoming Christian and you started this church, maybe it's four, five, ten of you. So in this video, what I want to do is that I want to just advise you on how you can deal with such kind of you know, a church, a church which is new, a church which has new membership, a membership which has never been to church before, which has probably never even read the Bible, or which do not know any doctrine or theology about Christianity, but only know what mainstream people know about God, Jesus Christ dying for sinners, and forgiveness of sinners and all that, because almost everyone knows that. So how would you go about dealing with these kind of people? Well, you know, the thing about life is that everyone is going through life in a way that has, you know, has given them problems. So everyone has a problem. It's very unlikely that a person who does not have any problem can become religious. I'm telling you, it's, it will be impossible for anyone without a problem to become religious. So in the same vein, it will be impossible for anyone without a problem. And a problem does not necessarily mean that I'm suffering or a problem may mean that, you know, I have all these things, but I have no meaning for life. You know, I, 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 I'm successful. I have all these things. I have education. I have got money, but I have no direction left. There are people who have such kind of problem. So I just wanted to show you that when I'm saying a problem, I don't mean like a problem does not have a job. I mean, a person does not have a job or a person is suffering. No, a problem can be the kind of problem that other people may not see as a problem because this person has money, this person is successful, this person is married and has kids. And then, you know, his kids' future are secured in terms of insurances and all of that. But he still feels like his life has no meaning. So when you are a pastor in a kind of church, what you're supposed to do is that you are supposed to deal with exactly that, the niggling issues in their lives. You don't have to talk about, you know, great theology, like, you know, God chose people from eternity and, and God has big plans in which all these big plans are going to be achieved. That is just too deep. You know, and, and sometimes you may end up losing them because what you're saying does not relate to what they really need to hear. And what I'm saying is that I don't want to present this thing that I'm trying to make you say something that is going to make people happy or say something that relates to them that keeps them in the church. Now, what I'm saying is that you have to use the, same, the very same Bible, you know, to deal with their niggling issues in such a way that you are making this God whom you preach, whom you believe in, this Christ who has, you know, given you his spirit, to be able to help them in such a way that they see that in the way that they live is sinful. You understand what I'm saying? So you're not really saying this, all these great theolo theolo theological things, all um, these mysteries of the Bible, all these mysteries of the kingdom of God. You're just saying simple things. For example, when a man is married, you know, he may not know how to treat his wife. He may be doing it, but because there's nothing which compels him to do it, he might not do it as regularly or as, as much as he should be doing it. So that's how you deal with that. You deal with marriage. You deal with marriage in the way that God wants marriage to be. You see, so you're sort of now making a life of this new uh, to be Christians because they won't be Christian at the time because they won't be converted because you don't just listen to the Bible today and then you already convert. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm saying that you know you cannot just think that Christians because on that day they came because they might not come next week. So for this would be Christian, what you're doing is that you're dealing with the niggly issues, their family problems. You know, the way God wants people to relate to one another. You deal with racism. You know, how the Bible does not like racism. There is no because if Jesus said that go out to the nations and preach to them, and those who believe baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that means that he was completely destroying nationalism. Because to the nation, it means that you are saying that an Englishman must go to Congo and preach to the Congolese. 
you're saying that you know a, a Brit, uh, uh, an Irish man must go to India and preach to the Hindus. So you're breaking all these national boundaries, and, and so you're showing them that who God is. But you're showing them in in such a way that they can see in the daily in their daily lives how they have been living in a wrong way, which was in opposition to God's way, without saying all these big things. And when you're you're you're, you're preaching to them the will of God in terms of day to day living, in such a way that you're showing how the world is living in a wrong way. And rebelliousness towards what what God wants the world and the world to live, you are opening their minds to the goodness of this God. You see, because if this God wants men to love their wives like own, their own skins, this God is good. If this God does not want men to cheat on their wives, not to say that you're, you're gonna go to the decalogue and say thou shalt not commit adultery. No. In, in the way that you tell a man that you know what if God says that you love your wife like your own skin you wouldn't want to harm your own skin so you wouldn't want to cheat on your wife so the language that you use is just you know you're still actually speaking about the dark color but you're not mentioning it but you're still biblical you're still Christ-like in a way that you're saying that you cannot claim to love a person but turn around and hurt them by sleeping for another woman or sleeping for another man why you are married to a man or married to a woman? You see that? So when you address these niggling issues which everyday people encounter in their lives, you know, in the way that you speak to people who have companies and say that, you know, the Lord God says that you must be you must be kind to your employees because he's also your master is in heaven. You know, so he's watching you, and because his employees when they cry out. They cry out to God. They may not cry out to God like God being something, but you have to realize that because God is sovereign king over the universe, everything that is wrong, everything that brings tears and pain to other human beings, it goes to God. And because God is the one who's in charge, he must do something. The same way as if there's unrest in some village or some town or some city, the, the, you know, the, the city must do something in terms of putting police there. You see, it's not like, you know, the, the people call the police or the people call you know the, the, the mayor and say that no the mayor heard about it and he wanted to do something why because he's the mayor he's supposed to make sure that there's peace in his town in his city you understand that so when you have a newly planted church you want to speak about the things which are problematic in daily living Without really going too much into theology, without really going too much into the great and the, the, the meat of, of, of the gospel, the meat of it, the, the very reason why we have the gospel to begin with. You just explain why God is the way that he is and why human beings are the way that they are and why human beings and God cannot, you know, cannot come together and become like sons and fathers and, and break, 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 I mean break bread. You see? When you do that, you're creating understanding that this 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 God is holy, is different, he's not the same as as us. You know, to compare a man to God would be like to compare a woman to a man, but a man and a woman are comparable because they are both creatures. But God is the creator. So he has no comparison. He he's in a class that cannot be classed. So all these things dealing with divorces, dealing with with, with sicknesses. In terms of how God, you know, understand that you get sick, but sometimes sickness can help you in humbling you. You know, this could be sort of, you know, me, and because it could be very meaty kind of the gospel, but it could also be on the surface that you know sometimes a person may be grieved that they're sick, but they may not understand that you know maybe over the weekend. A young man wanted to go to watch his favorite team play. And then, you know, Friday, he just catches flu. And then this flu becomes so terrible that he can't even get out of the house. And he's grieved that, you know, I should have been to, to the stadium and watched my football team play and enjoy the game and all that. But tomorrow, after the game, he hears that actually the car that he was supposed to ride in fell into an accident. All the people in the car died.
and because they died that means he would have been in the same car and he would have died so in a way he can start to rejoice in his sickness as a wife i didn't get sick i would have been i would have been dead so he sort of rejoice in his sickness rejoice in suffering you see so it is these small things which may not necessarily you know tell a person that you're a sinner or another, but it is the thing that makes people understand that this god is good because this god in, in even our daily lives he cares he cares about what happens in our daily lives and he shows himself he reveals himself in this kind of things, in this kind of example that I've given you about a young man who's sick and is angry that he's not able to go to and watch his favorite team play. So by dealing with this issue, small issues about children, about the way you know parents must deal with their children in accordance with the Bible, in the way that you know parents should not be oppressive toward their children. They should deal with them kindly, you know, teach them what is righteous so that the children can respond in a way that the parents want them to respond and and if the parents expect something the children they must teach them so they will have a right to expect you know the children to expect to you know to behave in a way that they want to be behave because they have taught them you see so when you're using you know daily living i mean if you're a human being you know what people go through in a daily in their daily lives when you dealing with these niggling issues you know you 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 bring you will even bring more people to your church why because they hear about these things which have been there but you're not promising them riches and and, and cars and, and Rolls Royces and chair and jets you know, you just you know just innocently dealing with their problems through scripture showing them the will of God showing them the righteousness of God and then they get to know this God. And because they get to know this God, as time goes, you would know if you're truly a man of God, you would know the time now to go deep into scripture now. To really now reveal, you know, the the danger of sin and the holiness of God and the hate of God towards sin. You see that? So, but if you do that, sometimes you may chase people away because people and are living in lives in which they live sinful lives, but they're not aware of it. But when you start pouring it down on them and saying that it is sinful and them, people are going to go to hell, you're chasing them away. But if you, and this is not to say that you're luring people in by, no, it is just the way that you're supposed to do it. You see, because you want to present God as a savior. And, but you don't want to present God as a savior in terms of you're sinful, you're going to hell and God wants to save you. No, you want to present God as a savior that he's, he's, he's even able to save them in the small things that they suffer from. You see that? You, so when you're able to do that, they will want to know more about this God. And because it will be what they want. So you'll literally be giving them what they want. So when you reveal more and more about the holiness of God, about the justice of God, about the righteousness of God, about the love of God, you're teaching them something that they want to know. Because obviously this is God through scripture, through your preaching, has made a difference in their lives. So they want to know more about it. You're giving them what they want. Because sometimes a lot of people believe that you know, they are you know, powerful preachers because they call people directly their names and then they call gay people you know directly their names and then they they sound all powerful but that is not what is not what you're supposed to do you see because the thing is that preaching actually what is supposed to do is to create understanding understanding first about god and when you understand god when a human being understands god they will understand themselves because a human being will always try to compare himself to god so when you show who God is and how he is and how he wants things done, then a human will realize that well, this God is far too holy for me. But you also have to present him in such a way that he invites them. If anyone thirsts, let him come and drink. You without money, come and buy milk and wine. When you make the invitation, when you make the invitation, then you're making them see that this God is holy, but he wants to make people holy. He wants to make people righteous so they don't have to harm each other anymore. 
You understand that? But of course, it will be different for people for a church which is already being in existence because you know, new people who have never been Christian, who have never really been to church, you have to treat them differently than people who have been to church to believe that they know something but they're living in a wrong way, opposing that which they claim to believe. Now, these ones, you can just literally go after them, go after the scripture which condemns them for being fake Christians. Because you will have the discernment. You must have the discernment to say that these people don't know anything about God. There's no need for me to tell them about the righteousness of God, the just of God against sin. No, you have to just tell them about their lifestyle, about the will of God for their lifestyle. You see, that's how you're going to win them over to the kingdom because they will realize that you know they were doing something, but they're not doing it incorrectly. They're not doing it I mean, they're not doing it correctly. They're not doing it in accordance of the way that God wants them to do it. So when you do that, you show them that God is not really against them. He just, you know, one of the, one of the greatest things in the book of Acts that a lot of missionaries have failed to apply is that when the, you know, the apostles wanted to say something to the new believers in Christ, in Greece and other, you know, countries, what they wanted to say, they didn't want to change the Greek to become like a Jew. They didn't want the, to, to convert you know, a Macedonian to become like a Jew. What they wanted to do, they just wanted to say that in what you're doing, just make sure that whatever you're doing is not adultery, not sexually immoral, does not oppose God's will, then you would have done well. So they didn't say that stopping Greek become like a Jew, like other Jews wanted. Now they're saying that don't do anything which is sexually immoral. Don't do anything which is adulterous. You understand? So, but most missionaries, when they came, became the third world countries like Africa and 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 and, uh, uh, and, and India, what they did is that the London Missionary Society would want to make the Indian look like an English Indian. So they didn't want to just say all these many gods which are worshiping. It's not right. You know, your culture, all these things which is sexually immoral is not right. You know, this is what God wants and reveal that. That's what the Bible instructs for missionaries. The Bible says don't change the people's culture because it is their culture which keeps them united. It is the very fiber of their society. When you destroy their culture, you can have lawlessness. And you are not going to have the Bible to, to teach them from scratch on how to build a new culture reform the culture don't don't destroy the culture so a lot of missionaries from germany you know the the berlin missionary society and the london missionary society what they did is that they destroyed people's cultures that's why at the end people either became lawless or they they hated god because god took everything at the end they didn't even want they, they where, where they arrived they don't even they even saying that there's no king there's don't, they, they want the king of England or queen of England to be queen, but they don't want these nations to have their own king. So they want these people to be subjective to their queen in England, but they don't want these people to have their own kings. At the end, that is destroying the very you know, authority of, 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 of their leadership in which if they were to be able to do it in such a way that they just make them to reform their culture, not to be sexually immoral, not to be adulterous, you will still have order and peace. So that's why a lot of people hate Christianity because the missionaries want to change them. Everything, when people are circumcising, they still practice circumcision, they say it's evil, it's, it's madness, it's, it's, it's barbaric, stop doing it. And the Bible says that circumcision benefits nothing and uncircumcision benefits nothing. So it doesn't matter when a person is circumcised or not. As long as they believe in Christ, and then they're saved. They can continue doing this circumcision if it's not sexually immoral. So you must tell them, keep doing it, but this thing, one, two, three, you must remove because it's sexually immoral and it's against God. Most people will be willing to change. But when you go there and say, everything is wrong, just throw everything out, believe in Christ. That is like the way Christ used to say that, you know, the Jews wanted to make other people like them. But... The Jews did not know God. So they were just turning them into themselves. So 
the London Missionary Society and the mission and the Berlin Missionary failed in a lot of ways because they wanted people whom they preached the gospel to be like the Germans or to be like the English, not to be like Christ. You see, and that in itself is sin because you're not supposed to make people be like you. You are supposed to make people be like Christ. Because when you make people be like you, the promise that what if you are not even saved? And you don't know it. But because you think you know scripture, you think you're saved. But anyway, that is getting away from what I wanted to say. All I wanted to say is that, you know, when you have a newly planted church with people who are new to the gospel, you know, they've, they've not been Christians. So you, all you have to do is just, you know, deal with the negative issue through scripture in such a way that God looks like a savior who's really even concerned about their daily lives, about their daily sufferings. And as time goes, when they believe in this God, they would want this God because of the goodness that you reveal in scripture when you're dealing with these people's problems. And that's when you can go to the meatier things of the gospel and really punch, I mean, plunge them into the kingdom of God. And that's all that I have to say. If you like to receive content like this, you can just subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for listening.